I'm really excited to, um, uh, to um, actually give this session because uh, what I'd like to do um, is take you into the future. Um, not next week, not next month, not even next year, but maybe 10, 15, 20 years into the future. Because my proposition to you is that humanity is going to change more over the next 25 years than it's done over the last 200. So what I want to do is want to talk a little bit about the transformative context. What is it that makes me say that? What are some of the disruptive technologies that we're seeing? How might those impact the future lives of real people? And share a number of conclusions. I'm going to be drawing on a lot of the insights in uh, the book, The Future of Business. Uh, I just want to remind everyone that you have the ability to download a free digital copy of the book, and I'd encourage you to do so. The thing about the book is, is that we've adopted an exponential process through which we undertake our business, be that publishing, be that any of our other activities. And this notion of exponentiality is something that I want to build on through this presentation. So what is the transformative context we're seeing? What is it? about exponential technology that we're seeing. The first thing to say is that we're not seeing these developments in technology in splendid isolation. We're seeing developments in technology happen at the same time and connected to a whole number of what I would call megatrends. So the overarching context is continual exponential growth, exponential change, through uncertainty, through new economic ideas, through new developments in science and technology, new lifestyle solutions, societal changes. So there's a lot of different things happening at the same time. Now, you may suggest that lots of those things have always happened at the same time. But I think that right now I'd argue that a lot more are happening at the same time and there's much more of a combinational impact about some of these things that we're seeing. And I particularly want to build on that notion around technology. So the one I want to really focus on is this notion of two worlds colliding. So what do I mean by that? Well, I think most of us, a lot of us, me included, are very much of a physical and local world mindset. What I mean by that is, we're used to manufacturing things, making things, things that have some sort of physical representation. We can touch and hold them. We kind of buy into the notion of technology and that technology is a significant change, but we also think of it as a tool. So we think of a problem and we understand that technology may, a may be able to help us reach a solution. People of a digital mindset part of the digitized society linked to what we might call a global brain, think of things a little bit differently. They don't see technology as a tool, they see it as a solution. So technology is the first place they go to. People of a digitized mindset have grown up in a world of social media, of connectivity, of lots of other interacting technologies. So there's a very different mindset, a very different approach to solutions around business, but also ways in which we live our lives outside of work. Work is another theme that I want to pick up later on as well. What does that mean? Well, I think that means that every sector is going to transform in the near-term future. So I suppose organizations have, to some extent, a bit of a choice. And the choice is seen to me to play by the rules. So be safe, be comfortable, use the kind of approaches, the tools, the techniques, the ways of doing business that we've done in the past. Or we can create a new game. We can actually create new rules, create new markets, be disruptive, enhance the opportunity and the possibilities that exponential technology development is actually giving us. But actually, the first place that we need to go to understand how we do that is inside our organizations and inside ourselves. So do we have the personal and the organizational DNA to actually change our outlook on life, to change our outlook on work, to change our outlook on our business, and change our outlook on the way that we interact maybe with our customers and consumers? 
And I think there's a big challenge there. Because I think if we're a small, nimble, new organization, a new business, growing rapidly, exploring opportunities, then I think we change our DNA as we grow. If we're a big, multinational, global organization, that's really hard. And that's why we've seen a number of those kind of organizations fall by the wayside over the years. Because they found it impossible to change their DNA. They found it impossible to think of new approaches to business, new ways of interacting with their customers. They've been so wedded to their brand, so wedded to the approaches that have led them to success in the past, that they can't see beyond those. Two examples I'd often point to um, are Blockbuster and Kodak. Blockbuster actually had a partnership offer on the table with Netflix, when Netflix was a small organization. Blockbuster doesn't exist. Netflix is worth about $28 billion. Kodak invented a digital camera. They decided that that was too much of a competition for their film business, which, by the way, they didn't believe Japanese companies would come in and take because they believed in their brand equity and the loyalty of their consumers in the marketplace. So there are some lessons there about how we need to change in order to continue to find success. Now, I've mentioned this notion of exponentiality. Um, for those of you that aren't familiar with Moore's Law, Moore's Law basically says that $1,000 worth of computing power will double round about every year. So if we extrapolate that over the next seven years, for an example, we could see computers with 128 times more power than we see today. What does that do with our ability to process information, to process data, to generate new insights? But as I've said, this notion of exponentiality is not just about the technology. It's not just about computing power. It's about attitude and belief and the way that we want to look for new ideas and new opportunities in the markets that we operate in. Here's a really good example of exponential thinking. This is a Chinese company that uh, has adopted a rapid modular construction process. And it can build a 57-story building in 19 days. Now, there's not really new technology here. So they're fabricating this building in a factory and then bringing it to site and doing construction there. But the notion of changing the way that they undertake their construction allows them to create these kind of buildings in that kind of short period of time. So a notion of exponentiality, not just the technology. But what, some are, what are some of the disruptive technologies that we're seeing? I think I'd like to count this, first of all, by saying, in my mind, there's a kind of an idea that maybe magic and science are blurring. So some of the things that we're seeing emerge at the moment out of laboratories um, are kind of a little bit way out there. They're kind of wacky. Not that long ago, they were probably in the realm of science fiction. Now, I'm not suggesting all these new technologies that are being looked at now will hit the market and will be successful. Some of them won't. But the fact is, everything I'm going to talk about is real now in that it is being worked on, it is being developed. In some cases, patents are being applied for. So the notion of some of these new technologies, this idea that maybe magic and science are blurring, is real. And we're seeing some of these coming around human enhancement, transhumanism, which is the idea that humans and machines will merge. So I just want you to hold that thought. Because this is the reality of where we are with technology. We're seeing a technology explosion. I'd couch it as a possibility explosion from these technology developments. From 3D printing, which we're fairly familiar with, I think, to 4D printing, which is 3D printing with materials that can change their properties. Energy innovation, brain uploading. Just bear in mind what I said just now, that this isn't science fiction. This is stuff that's in the labs now. Human augmentation, blockchain technology, a hyper-connected internet of humanity. And I do want to build on this idea that, independently, these technologies are pretty powerful. But where we are right now is we're seeing these technologies come together in combination to create much more powerful ideas, much more powerful technologies. It's the combination of robotics and artificial intelligence that gives us the idea that artificial, artificially intelligent robots could form a place in our workforce in the future. And I posed a question yesterday at a, um, at a session that I spoke at. As a marketeer, how do you market to an artificially intelligent robot? 
We've seen what happens when technologies come together in the past. So if you think about how computers evolved, um, at one point they took up a whole room and you needed to go through an airlock to get into them. They came out of the room, onto the desk, onto the lap, onto your lap and into your hand. A similar thing happened to the telephone and we've had the smartphone. So just think about the combinational impact of those two reasonably simple technologies and the fundamental change they've had to the way that we live our lives, to the way that we work, to the way that we interact with people. We've also seen technologies come off the desk, out of our hands, and onto our bodies in terms of wearables. We've seen things like Google Glasses, um, uh, the Apple iWatch, um, but we're seeing other technologies as well. Technologies not only that monitor how fast our heart beats when we run, but also technologies where electronic generation is woven into the fabric, processing power is woven into our clothes, GPS is fitted into our shoes. So this notion of technology being on us is really starting to move forward. But then it's going to go inside us. Now, that sounds maybe a weird concept, but if you think we've had technology inside us for a long time, from heart pacemakers, um, eye, ear implants, we've also seen prosthetics, we've seen limb replacements, so the idea of technology inside us is maybe not new. What's different, maybe, is the use of uh, drugs and um, what we might think of as processing technology, which could come in, go inside us, which could be connected to our brains, we're also seeing an increasing number of what I would call augmented, multisensory, and immersive technologies. Now, I think this is a particularly interesting area from a marketing point of view. So if we think about the potential of haptic technologies to create a physical representation to kind of enhance our senses with some of these other multisensory immersive technologies, what about the combination of virtual world 3D worlds with a haptic suit on so we can feel what's happening at the time we interact with the technologies? How does that potential technology combination change how we might share experiences with consumers and customers? Um, how do we interact with them? How do we get them to feedback about their experiences? Just mentioned very briefly um, uh, virtual reality. Uh, we've seen uh, already how the virtual reality goggles are getting smaller. The interesting thing about this is that virtual reality is really just coming into three dimensions. It exists in two dimensions for a long time. Is anyone familiar with Second Life? How many of you realize that the internal economy in Second Life is worth half a billion dollars? So you have people trading items, materials, clothes, land, buildings in a virtual world across the membership of Second Life, and that eternal internal economy is worth $500 million. Now that begs the question, what is real, what is reality, and what is virtual reality? Does it matter which of those realms I operate in? Does it matter which of those realms I conduct my business in? But does it change the way that I might interact with customers and consumers? And I think this combination of some of the haptic technologies we're seeing and virtual reality, as those technologies get much slicker, much smaller, much more interactive, I think that's going to create some really interesting opportunities. So what does that tell us about the connectivity between those things? I guess most people are quite familiar with the concept of the Internet of Things. So lots of different objects connected through the Internet. Um, if some estimates are right, and over the next 10, 15, 20 years, whatever it might be, we have 200 billion devices connected to the internet around the world. What kind of wealth of data does that give us? How do we access that data? We couldn't probably, we probably couldn't access that data effectively right now. But if we look at the way computing power is moving, computing technologies are changing, Artificial intelligence is giving us new capability to perhaps produce, uh, perform things like predictive analysis. Then we can begin to say, see how valuable that information is. But what about the Internet of People? Not just the way we connect through our devices at the moment, but maybe we connect with people through the things that we wear, maybe the technologies that are inside us, maybe within virtual worlds. So this Internet of People is also going to create a wealth of new types of data that we can, should be able to access. 
Now, I've mentioned artificial intelligence a couple of times, and this question about what's all the fuss about, I think, is a, is a, is a really worthwhile question to ask. Artificial intelligence, an area of computer science that emphasizes the creation of intelligent machines that work and react like humans. So we've seen machines in the past. Those machines have tended to take on fairly routine, um, repetitive type work, so that we've seen them in a manufacturing setting, uh, car making, for example. What artificial intelligence now does is says, actually, we can take that away from, or as well as the blue collar sector, we can bring that into services, into the white collar sector. And what we're now starting to see is significant numbers of accounting firms and legal firms where the traditionally they've been done with pen, paper, computer, but now what we're seeing is some of those repetitive processing type tasks can also be undertaken by artificially intelligent machines as well. So even the notion of law, to some extent, can be prepared, presented to customers, to clients, through the use of artificial intelligence. Now, I'm not suggesting in both the case of finance and in legal that the whole of those two sectors could be. But I think it's interesting that we're seeing that domain which has historically been the preserve of white-collar worker people is now finding that artificial intelligence is coming in and producing work and replacing people. Um, I, someone else used this slide um, yesterday. I think it might have been someone from Google even, but I think this is quite interesting. It kind of builds on the point um, about how artificial intelligence is changing. So this game go, kind of like um, uh, a complex version of chess, uh, multi-hundreds of millions of moves. Um, and Google actually came up against uh, the Go world champion. Now, the interesting thing about the artificial intelligence here is it ut utilizes machine learning to understand its environment. It observed the first game, which the human won, but it learned from that. It didn't just learn all the moves, it learned how to strategize in the context of the game. And the next four games went to the artificial intelligence. So this notion of being able to learn is something that's particularly new for computers and is fundamental to the change of artificial intelligence. Now, what we are seeing at the moment, even with these kind of apl applications, is a sort of a narrow artificial intelligence. So the artificial intelligence is established to perform a particular task. But what happens when that artificial intelligence can broaden the context with which it considers issues, problems, develops solutions? What if it can operate across a range of different paradigms? What if, and it if it becomes artificially generally intelligent? What happens if artificial intelligence can be emotionally intelligent. So there are some really interesting areas that um, AI can take us into in the future, and some of these could challenge our notion of life, of what it is to be human, when your arti artificially intelligent robot decides that actually it has the same rights that you do. Just to bring it back a little bit, what is much more likely in the near term, and to some extent is already happening now, is artificially intelli artificial intelligence um, curating our days, managing our diary, booking things for us. So this notion maybe of having a digital assistant or even a digital twin, where maybe we upload our brains onto the internet and our brain's off doing something over here for us and we're kind of down here grooving away doing our usual thing. So this notion of how AI can change what we do with the information we have, the information that we access, and how we're represented in the digital world can create some interesting challenges in the future. The scope of AI, I think, is only limited by our imagination. So there's no reason to doubt that at some point in the future, AI can help us with things like governance, with monitoring a whole range of different areas, thinking about risk frameworks for scientific research, thinking about how drug discovery works. Drug companies are already using AI to help them sift through um, millions of molecule candidates, maybe even the creation of new life forms. So this is why I think AI is a really big game changer and why I think that the proposition I laid out to start with, that maybe humanity is facing more change over the next 25 years than it's seen in the last 200, could be the reality. I mentioned a couple of times about uh, brain unloading. This notion of brain-computer interface is something that's really interesting. It's kind of started 
um, uh, with a medical or health point of view in mind. So how can we um, replicate the necessary processes that help uh, patients suffering from some degree of paralysis to get movements back in their limbs? But in addition to that, we're seeing BCI, brain-computer interface, also start to touch things like um, touchless typing. So is there a way I can get my computer to type things just by thinking it, or just by um, kind of connecting my brain to the computer? Now, at the moment, those experiments are happening with a physical connection. But what happens when you can make those connections wireless? So our brain-computer interface is completely wireless. 3D printing, I've mentioned it briefly, but I think this is a really great example of how fundamentally this can change. Um, uh, this is, depending on your point of view, either a cool looking car or not. But what is cool about it is that it's 3D printed. It's 3D printed by a company in the US. It has 50 components. A kind of a normal family car is likely to have about 5,000 components. So you can really begin to see how much easier the production process is. It's much, much cheaper to develop a model of car like this. It's much, much cheaper to produce a model of car like this. And when you set up a manufacturing facility, you probably need a fifth of the volume to make the plant viable that you would do with a conventional car. So this is a really great example of how maybe 3D printing changes whole industries. So do you need the great big car plants that we tend to see now? Or do you need a network of very local plants producing 3D printed cars for a local community? Because that changes shipping, it changes logistics, changes the way you buy, and it changes the way that you run a car business. Talking of cars, um, autonomous vehicles, and, and I always like to make the point that what we're talking about here is not just autonomous cars. We're talking about cars, planes, boats, you name it. Anything that moves, it can become autonomous. The military is a kind of a good start point for some of this technology, but obviously what we're now seeing, we're now seeing experiments on public roads for these kind of vehicles. And actually, maybe that creates a new way to own cars or not. Because what we do see is that we see younger people much less wedded to the idea of ownership of an asset and more open to the notion of sharing that asset. So maybe there's a pool of people that share an autonomous car. They just call up the car when they need it on their smartphone and the car drives it them itself to them. Maybe that then takes them to wherever they need to go and off it goes to service the one of the other shared owners. So this notion around autonomous vehicles really does fundamentally change the ideas that we might have, the traditional ideas we might have, around asset ownership. Blockchain technology, um, I can't remember off the top of my head which country it is, but the, the, there's, a, there's a country around, um, I think it's in the Middle East, that has decided it wants all of its public service financial contracts to be handled on blockchain. Now, blockchain is a, is a technology that was created for Bitcoin, the digital currency, and it basically eliminates this kind of central clearing mechanism by creating a completely transparent and open ledger to other owner members. So the owner members remain on, uh, or, um, anonymous, but at the same time, there is visibility about the transactions. There are a number of companies around the world now looking at blockchain technology in order to create private blockchains so that systems, approaches, processes, workflow, um, our whole business decision-making processes can be undertaken by this digital technology. So I've spoken quite a bit there about some of the technologies that, uh, that we're starting to see, and I think that, that range of technologies interest me, um, but I think they stand to fundamentally change some of the things that we do. Um, in work and leisure, the way that we live our lives. So what might some of these technologies change in our future lives? What might they mean? The first thing is, we may have to get used to living and working in a world of multiple actors. So not just normal humans like us, well, like you anyway, <laughs> but maybe augmented humans, maybe humans augmented by drugs, maybe um, humans augmented by some kind of IT but also robots, androids, holograms, other forms of 
artificially intelligent display-based manifestations. So our workplace becomes much, much different than we're used to in the past. Maybe we'll end up competing with intelligent robots for our next job. What's interesting is when you start to ask a number of professionals the likelihood of their job being taken over by robots. The sum I think we can make sense of, I spoke a little bit yesterday about, in another session, about uh, chatbots. So telemarketeers um, kind of make sense when we understand what that technology is, and we can understand where that's going. I spoke a little bit about um, accountants, so accountants and, audience, uh, and auditors are pretty sure that their jobs are going to go to robots in the future. Uh, retail salespersons, what's quite interesting is I know there are some airports in the airport stores that are starting to introduce artificially intelligent robots um, to man the stores and the shops at airports. But what's really interesting, I think, is when we start getting down here, down to commercial pilots. So with this survey, which was uh, conducted uh, through The Economist, commercial pilots said it was, 50 it was a 50% chance that their jobs would be automated by robots in the future. Now, of course, we know the technology already exists to fly planes from the ground um, into the air, back onto the ground again. But actually, um, maybe there's something stopping us getting on a plane with no one sat at the front. But maybe that will change with new generations. So the take home from this, I think, is that some of these technologies really are going to change the world of work. Now, when you talk to people and you look at some of the research around the world of work, there are some really interesting bits of feedback that you get. So if you pose the question, will network automated AI and robotic devices displace more jobs than they create over the next 10, 15 years? Half the people say, yeah, uh, that will happen across blue and white collar sectors. Um, it will generate increases in income inequality and there will be significant numbers of unemployable people, potentially breakdowns in social order, a little bit dystopian. But on the other side, um, half of the people said, actually, technology won't displace more jobs than it creates. It will undoubtedly displace a whole lot of the jobs that we're seeing at the moment, but actually we believe in human ingenuity, and we believe that human ingenuity will, like it has done before, create new work opportunities for people. But when we look a little bit deeper, we can see whereabouts the vulnerability for some of these jobs is. So this particular study says uh, nearly half of workers in the US, for example, had jobs at high risk of potential automation. But we can see, one thing we can see, we can see a kind of a common thread about the sort of jobs that are likely to be taken over by some of these new technologies, so transport and logistics. Um, so Uber will not need to worry about drivers in the future, and indeed Uber are one of the companies that are already looking at driverless vehicles and how that might change their business model. Sales and services, office support. One of the things that does seem consistent across some of these pieces of research is that more creative industries are likely to get off a little bit lighter. It's quite hard to imagine an artificial intelligence that could actually be as creative as humanity can. But the one thing that is quite clear um, is that there is a big impact coming. And I think one of the things that companies, businesses, as well as governments need to be aware of is the potential impact of those. And actually start thinking now about what is it that we do to create an environment that first of all continues to generate enough economic activity so people can benefit, whilst at the same time ensuring that the technologies that we're seeing and the technologies emerging do so for the sake of humanity and not for the sake of the tech codes. A lot of people talk now about the impact of these changes on education. So maybe two thirds of children entering primary school today will work in jobs that don't yet exist. So that's another piece of research that basically says the world of work is changing, and it's changing really quite fast. It, I'm not going to handle this, uh, this issue now, but it does beg the question, what do we do about education in the future? What we are seeing, though, so whereas in a couple of slides ago I was talking about the jobs that we thought were likely to go, some of the jobs and functions expect to become more critically important as we go forward, things like data anal analysts um, looking to leverage the big data created through artificial intelligence, maybe specialised sales representatives, so really trying to understand how to commercialise and articulate changing and new business propositions. 
and senior managers and leaders looking to steer companies through the upcoming change and disruption. And I'm going to come back to that point a little bit later on, because I think there's a whole kind of skills piece that we need to think about um, in, uh, in the way that we move business forward. So by 2020, more than a third of the desired core skill sets of most occupations will be comprised of skills that are not considered, to, uh, that are not considered crucial today. And they are, we are starting to kind of see this switch between, if you like, technical skills and more social skills. So maybe the softer skills. And we're going to build on that um, in a second. But hopefully what this does, it starts to build a body of evidence that sort of backs up what I've been saying about the importance, the significance, and the change potential of some of these technologies. So let's think about our future family. What kind of choices and challenges might they have? Well, they might have to decide whether they want to go for human augmentation or not. Maybe one of their colleagues in the office um, has decided to have some kind of procedure that uh, improves their memory. So what are the genetic modifications, nootropic cognitive enhancer drugs that can help us be more effective at work? If AI is ubiquitous and automation is taken over most, chance, uh, most tasks, will our performance monitoring and appraisals be automated? Because our employer knows exactly what we're doing, when we're doing, and how successful we've been. And what about personal tech? What about the way that our lives are diary managed by artificial intelligence? We just get told what to do, maybe, rather than making up our own minds. Maybe in the future, the gig economy is now the norm, and that changes the way that we work, changes the way that we employ people. And that's something that is potentially going to be driven not only by the ability of technology to enable it, but also by the desires of people coming into work to work in a new way. But maybe there are a number of different paths that we can take as individuals. So what about privacy in a digital world? At the moment, we give so much of our information away Maybe in the future we don't want to do that. On the other hand, we may have to, to get access to the services, to the digital services that we want. Maybe we have some choices about brain-computer interface. What if knowledge becomes ubiquitous and becomes easy to access simply by downloading it into your brain for the internet? Do you need to go to university anymore? We can simply download what we need to know. Personal transport may change the way that we move around. Pooled autonomous vehicles, we've spoken about personal drones. So given all this stuff, what are the conclusions that we can draw? Well, to my mind, the conclusions are science and technology are reshaping every aspect of our world, not just um, the world of work, not just the way that we spend our leisure time. It's reshaping everything that we do. The world of work will change, and it's likely to change rapidly and significantly, and the macro outlook, therefore, is volatile. So this kind of change we've used, and I'm sure we're all familiar with the notion of change as a constant, a rapid, exponential, disruptive change, I would argue, is the constant for the future. And societal norms, as a result of some of these drivers, will change. I just want to skip through again why. Because information and communications technology is changing rapidly from the mobile internet, next generation intelligent and personal assistance, the internet of things, big data, data mining, blockchain systems, distributed and autonomous organizations. So IT, we know, is changing fast, and we've seen what happens in the past. But not only that, so is production and construction systems and technology. We can 3D print houses now. We can use biomimicry and apply that to product and engineered systems and design. We can think about how is it we use rapid green and sustainable construction. We can look at how advanced robotics and drones are starting to drive some of the things that we do that are different, some of the services that we provide and the way that we move around. What about citizen services domestic and domestic infrastructure? So things like healthcare and caring, human enhancement we've spoken about, autonomous and self-drive vehicles. New societal infrastructure and services, we've spoken a little bit about, um, uh, about things that would support e-government, for example, the use of artificial intelligence. But what about new methods of farming? What about being farming into the city, using vertical farms in order to create food where it's actually needed? Industry transformation, we've already spoken a little bit about the finance industry and the legal industry. So we're seeing big changes happening in sectors that have arguably been a little bit separated, a little bit divorced from the notion of radical change, and particularly um, uh, from some of the changes that we see through automation and technology. 
and energy and environment. So what is it that we need to do now? What is it we're seeing happen now um, uh, with the production of power um, uh, from new technologies? Interesting, I think it was um, uh, one day last week, the UK, believe it or not, actually produced 25 of its power needs, its electricity power needs, from at one point in the day through solar power. So that's an interesting change from a country that used to be very reliant on fossil fuels. So one of the other conclusions is we need to make sure that we move forward into a world that's supported by technology and not subservient to it. Because maybe that's a risk if we don't think about what the technologies actually mean for us now and how that might change into the future. I have a notion in my head which is actually if the motive is profit, then we need to think about the implications of how that profit and responsibility around generating that profit allows organizations and businesses to move forward. So how is it that we create a very human exponential business? How is it we think about all these things and start to say, so what does it mean for us if we want to create a human future for our business? I think the first thing that comes to my mind is actually working across three parallels. So I think most of our businesses are probably pretty good here. We know what we need to do over the next 12 months. We know what we need to do to bring the objectives we've set into land. Most organizations also operate very much here. So what is it that we need to do to continue to grow the business next year? Whereabouts are the opportunities? I think it's in those two pieces, making those two pieces work really well, that we can start to build a mindset, think about the talent that we need, think about the agility that we need, because we also really need to consider what's happening out here. Because if we don't ha see what's happening out there, then we become Blockbuster or Kodak. So I spoke earlier on about maybe some new skills that we need going forward. These are what I would argue are some of the critical skills to make sense of a rapidly changing future. Things like foresight, curiosity, sense-making, accelerated learning. See, these are much softer skills than maybe we've seen in the past. Coping with complexity. I have a notion in my head that actually says um, we're kind of pretty good at what I would call ordinary management. That's where we can be pretty clear about what it is we need to do because we can kind of understand the problem. But if we don't necessarily even understand the problem, then maybe we're into the realm of wicked problems. Maybe we need something like extraordinary leadership in order to understand that and understand what we need to do about that. And that's not just about how we manage our businesses, but I think it's also about how we develop propositions and communicate to customers and consumers. And it's not just me that says this either. This was the um, Institute for the Future kind of put this analysis together. What they basically said is there are a number of critical drivers going forward into the future. What they then said what then was there are a whole bunch of different what we think are important skills that we need to, uh, we need to be good at. And how do they link to these different drivers? So you've kind of got a template here that says there's a whole bunch of things happening and these are the kind of things that we need to know in order to access the opportunities that this world presents to us. I kind of almost hesitate when I, when I, when I use this slide because we do need to create time for change without a doubt. Um, we kind of need to simplify and tackle complexity, whether that's the customer interface, interface, about process, about information systems, about the way we regulate, or about being human in this new context. But the reality is that our world is increasingly complex. So I think we need to look for simplicity, but not ignore the reality that what's happening is very complex, very uncertain, very unsettling. And maybe we need to go beyond thinking about the machines. Maybe we need to go beyond um, what the computers tell us we should be doing. And maybe we need to rebalance the masculine with the feminine. What I mean by that is technology is kind of quite masculine in its, uh, in its nature. You know, it's, it's helping us do things. It's helping us get better and better, stronger. But maybe what we need to think about in order to help our organizations develop to get to a world where actually humanity does prevail over machines is actually think about some of the more social aspects, the more emotional aspects of the way that we conduct our businesses. So extenuate the feminine, if you like, rather than the masculine. So thank you for the time, for your time. I hope you found that interesting. Um, and as I say, do download your free copy of the book.